I would like to uh, open up the question and answer period. I would ask the people who have questions to approach the microphone that is uh, up here on this side of the room. Or if there are any questions, I would also ask people who have questions to stick or to, uh, to stay by the theme of tonight's uh, lecture, national relations and national movements in the Soviet Union. Uh, my explanation, of course, is, is one of possible variants. It's possible a lot of different explanation of Soviet situation in this field, national relations and national movements. In my opinion, Turkish components of Soviet Union, it's Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Turkmens, Kyrgyz, Tatars, Bashkirs, are most perspective resources of national, future national revolution in Soviet Union. First, first of all, these Turkish nations have now a lot of resources. First of all, uh, in past they were um, in back, backwards. Backward. Now they preserve national traditions and additionally they have now education so they have now not complex or, or inferiority towards to russian but complex of superiority they have normal traditional life and contemporary <coughs> life <coughs> secondly a demographic explosion very fast growth of population it's additional resource and uh, in my opinion, most, <coughs> most uh, good perspective, it's neighbors, movement in Iran, movement in Afghanistan. Uh, movement in Afghanistan, it's a uh, uh, lie of West. Uh, movement in Iran uh, was, as a rule, anti-American. But in fact, these two revolutions in Iran, in Afghanistan, it's the same. Because it's, because it's awakening of national roots, awakening of national traditions. So it's good influence to Soviet Asia. Um, I suppose in future, this region, uh, Soviet Turkish Asia, uh, will be main troublemaker to Soviet Empire. Thank you. Do you think this uh, sequence will happen like a domino effect or will it just uh, like Iran and uh, Afghanistan nationalist uprising? Well, absolutely different situation and different routes. Afghanistan, Iran, both. But, but in fact the same tendency. It's so-called right revolution. Traditional revolution, revolution of traditionalism. Uh, in the United States is now special terminology. Reaganism in revolution of rights. So this, revo this revolution of tradition will be in future in Soviet Asia because this region with very good preserved tradition. That's my opinion. I have two questions. My first is, um, Concerning the statistics about minority uh, growth in the Soviet army, if this uh, trend continues, will the Russians be able to count on their armies to quelch uh, or put down any serious uprisings in the minority um, republics in the future? I suppose no solution in this situation because Russia Empire is impossible, that's impossible for, for Russian Empire decrease number of soldiers. Because war in Afghanistan, situation in Poland, very big tension on Chinese border. It need more and more soldiers. So in my opinion, no solution like for British Empire after World War II. Okay, if what's going to happen to the Russian Empire is what happened to the British Empire, namely that the colonies got independence. Fine, I can hardly wait. Um, my, uh, my second question doesn't necessarily have to do directly with this uh, topic of today, nationalism, but I was wondering, 
there seem to be some um, pretty dramatic changes going on in China today. And I was wondering, do you think that such economic changes uh, would be possible in the medium to long run in the Soviet Union, especially since the, the old guard and the Politburo seem to be dropping off one by one? <laughs> Uh, this very important question, I will answer with translating. translation. Translation. Uh, it appears to me that these changes are very symbolic in China. Well, this means that Marxism is somehow degenerating, disappearing. The largest communist country in the world is somehow falling apart. <coughs> but he doesn't believe that the uh, Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet uh, country will follow along those lines as China has, or presently doing. The Soviet uh, State is too old. Not only the, uh, the physical aspects of the Politburo, the system itself is imperative. Uh, an interesting uh, analogy, story about Moscow today. Черненко каже, говорить, що в мене є склероза. Uh, Cherno uh, Chernenko says that there's a sclerosis. Uh, uh, in us, with us, there is no sclerosis. Yet, well, I think you understood that. Chernenko <laughs> okay. uh, said, I have no sclerosis, but a uh, friend Andropov has sclerosis. Because he is absent for three months in Politburo. I think uh, Chernenko might have it too now. Dobro <laughs> 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 В Советском Союзе КГБ проводит разделы, так как у Книнцев и Жидил, чтобы они против себя боролись, чтобы они разом против Советского Союза. Что вы думаете, что они только то работают в Советском Союзе, а также тут, в Канаде, в Америке и в Европе? Uh, in his uh, in his lecture that the uh, in the Soviet Union the uh, two forces or two forces that are present the Ukrainian and the uh, Jewish forces are somehow being uh, drawn apart so that they can't work together as as uh, as, as one force is this true in uh, what was in is it also true in the West in, in are the they West. also working in the West to cause a confrontation <coughs> <or just in? coughs> you're right uh, but in Soviet Union, in this field, KGB has no success. We had no problems, we Ukrainian dissidents, had no problems with relationship with Jewish dissidents in Soviet Union. But here in the West, KGB has real success in this field. I would like to uh, point your attention to an article written by well-known uh, author Milovan Gilas and published recently in German newspaper Die Welt. And Milan, Milovan Gilas, probably studying the same subject of nationality problems in the Soviet Union, came to the same conclusion as Dr. Moroz presented this subject uh, to <clears throat> this audience and he says that regardless of uh, stress 
and Russification in the Soviet Union, uh, the nation still exists. Uh, and uh, what is very interesting, the topic, uh, rather no topic, uh, uh, the article was published under very uh, symbolic uh, uh, headline, which says that systems coming and disappearing, but station, uh, but nations staying, regardless of all the pressures. And uh, I really, I'm pleased that uh, completely, uh, I don't think that Dr. Moroz uh, was in touch with Milovan Giras, but studying the same subject, both of the authors came to similar conclusion. Thank you. In fact, big resources of non-Russian nation is fact that non-Russian nations are able now to be communist but non-Russian, communistic but non-Russian. Exists in Soviet Union joke, very good joke, that's in fact theory, not joke. Uh, some radish, normal radish from the garden wanted to join the Communist Party. <laughs> but in Politburo said, no, you read only outside, <laughs> you're white inside. So this Ukrainian communist, Lithuanian communist are red outside only. Inside there are Lithuanian, Ukrainian. That's eternal resource of every national movement. I have a question. Uh, you have mentioned that, well, you have been saying that there's a growing uh, nationalist identity in uh, the Soviet Union. What is the role of the Western countries? What stand should we take? Um, and how should we accomplish our aims? That's in general the American and the free world. I suppose, first of all, West should understand process in the East. Now we have not too big understanding of process in the East. West is, in general, not too interested, I mean, typical Western person. Good example, this apologies of American government to Polish government. Um, Polish service of the old liberty called uh, government or Jaruzelski fascist, Hitlerist government. Uh, Jaruzelski uh, gave a protest, and American government gives, uh, gave uh, apologies. After that of Popilushko, in my opinion, Polish Jaruzelski government had three teachers, Hitler, Stalin, and Mr. Devil. But American government is so naive with this apologies. It's a typical situation. All right, so is what, what solution is there? Concrete solution. Solution is very simple. We, who understand it, we must find a normal, effective way to influence, to influence Western society. That's normal way. Create a good lobby groups. Create a groups for influence main points of Western society. <coughs> That's, it, it means work, work, and work, not, not talking la, like in Ukrainian communities. Thank you very much. Dr. Morrow, can you please talk to the microphone, sir? <coughs> it's Dr. Morrow. Uh, I have no doubt that the Ukrainian nation will survive no matter what happens in the Soviet Union. But as you mentioned, the uh, Baltic countries uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, where the populations are very small, uh, where the Russification is very, very strong, do you feel from your experience they do have a uh, chance? Well, uh, every situation has pluses and minuses. In Ukrainian case, it's a big population, 50 million. In Ukrainian case, 
its good history with Cossack era, with Kievan Empire era, but in case of Baltic nations, Lithuanians, Latvian, Estonians are their own resources. In my opinion, main resource is existing of 20 years independent states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. So this heritage, <coughs> is, it's not impossible now to um, out, take out this heritage. For example, in Lithuania is now not Russification. In Lithuania is now process of Lithuanization of foreign element. In Estonia, big population uh, percentage, big po Russian population. But Estonian nation is very strong, I mean in spirit. Worst situation in Baltic states has uh, Latvia. In Latvia, very big Russian population. I'm not profit. I, I will not give uh, some um, prescription for this or that nation. But in my opinion, no, so na ihirshi časi za tih narodi u pozadi. The worst times are over for those nations just mentioned. Worst time is over, in my opinion. In my opinion, very critical situation, very uh, serious situation, the situation of uh, Volga nation, for example, Tatars, Bashkirs, Chuvash, Mordva, I have been in Mordovia. These nations preserve their identity, but they are in Russian surrounding. Well, concrete prognosis are impossible as a rule. For example, Lenin was asked in Second Congress of Social Democratic Party, when will be your revolution? He said approximately in 100 years. This revolution was in 14 years. In different cases, this kind of revolution or movement, uh, people said it will be tomorrow, but it was not tomorrow. So it is it impossible to give a concrete date, dates and concrete um, prognosis. But in my opinion, Soviet Empire now has no resources. Good example, war in Afghanistan. It first war of Soviet regime who what Soviet regime is not able to win and situation is in Poland in Poland it's not explosion like in Czechoslovakia like in Hungary in Poland we have a process continuous process and most of regime is not able to stop this process it's good evidences of collapse future collapse of regime, in my opinion. Uh, yes, uh, pertaining to the Russian youth, I'd like to know, um, with, there's a lot of hardship there, we know there's, uh, uh, I'd like to know, does the Russian youth have the will to continue imposing the oppression on other countries that the old hardliners have? Are they willing to still suffer when they uh, grab power, are they willing to still suffer, still continue the old line, or will they, ha will they make change now that the old government is falling apart? It's a very interesting question. As a rule, Western person has uh, Western logic, so it must be changed in normal way. But in dictatorship, in uh, totalitarian society, is no this uh, logic of Western, Western kind. Uh, in this kind of society, like now in Soviet Union, something is collapsed just suddenly, like in Iran. Do you remember? Some prognosis said Iran, Shak Iran, will be fifth power in world in uh, 2000 years. 
Shah Iran is very strong. But next day, Shah Iran was collapsed suddenly. In my opinion, Soviet regime will not change himself, itself. Soviet regime will collapse suddenly, like a rising of solidarity in, in Poland. Do you remember this summer, 80, 1980? Nobody was uh, thinking next day, next month, will create in Poland uh, 1,100 people, big union. 11 million people union. You were talking about nationalism and uh, sort of <coughs> or, uh, strength of nationalism in the Soviet Union. I just uh, would like to ask you a question. A lot of people talk about um, a religious renewal now in the Soviet Union. What is your opinion or your assessment of that as a nationalism in the Soviet um, It's a good question because religious movement and national movement in Soviet Union now is joint. It's one phenomenon, like in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, national war against Russian invaders and Islamic factor, that's one, one phenomenon. The same in Soviet Union. For example, in Ukraine now began something new. Last year in Ukraine appeared six editions of new underground magazine, a chronicle of Ukrainian Catholic Church. But this chronicle is very nationalistic, Catholic and nationalistic. In Ukraine exists now new sect, new religion group, Pokutniki. It's sect with feeling and theory of Ukrainian messianism. Ukraine will save the world because Ukraine was suffered too much. Ukraine is New Jerusalem. It's very typical for contemporary Soviet Union. In Latvia, Estonia is now rebirth of Calvinism, uh, Lutheranism. First time, for the first time in Latvian, Estonian history is joining of Lutheran feeling and national feeling. I'm not <laughs> theologue. This is not my topic today, explain theologic questions. But in my opinion, thousand years of Christianity, it's Ukrainian celebration. Because thousand years ago existed no Russia. Russian nation will create it after. Russian historians said, Russian nation created in 14th century. So it's non-Russian celebration. It's like Spain or Portuguese. They was, was, were formed on basic on Latin language after a uh, Roman conquest. So something from Roman history is not something from Portuguese history. Because Portuguese nation was not exist in time of Roman Caesar. It's my opinion. Uh, staying a little bit later in the evening, perhaps we'll limit the questions to uh, how many more? Two, three, perhaps? That's your matter. I speak only if you're a uh, master. But you do have to answer. <laughs> okay, uh, so perhaps uh, three more questions. Well, I'm very new Canadian. The Ukrainians, I hear so called invisible minority, because black or Chinese is visible minority. So we are invisible minority. We have own problems. I suppose my experience in Canada is too small for solution of this main problem of Canada. French Canadian, English Canadian. Uh, last question. Russian communist government is fighting very strong against, against um, Christian church because communism it's a, is a quasi-religion. It's, it's, in fact, in communist understanding, communism must be religion for Soviet person. But <coughs> Russian communists, Moscow communists, understands very good Russian Orthodox Church was foundation of Russian Empire for centuries. 
So Russian communists are too clever not destroyed absolutely, completely Russian Orthodox Church. Other case, Muslim religions. It factor who preserved Muslim nations from Russification. So fighting against Muslim religion or Ukrainian Catholic Church or Lutheranism is of course stronger compared to fighting against Russian Orthodox Church. In my opinion, uh, of course, Canada is absolutely different world compared to America with own face, of course. But in general, North American society is reality. <coughs> it's possible to say about North America, United States and Canada. Uh, in America, okay, United States, um, I suppose exists not one America. One America in New York, absolutely different in Los Angeles absolutely different in Oregon or Denver, Colorado. I will go to Denver next month uh, for lesson. Uh, well, um, person who introduced me said, I spent 14 years in Soviet prison. It's not true, it's mistake, because I spent 13 years in Soviet prison, but I take it easy I said as a rule, well, yes, 14 years, 13 years in Soviet prison and one year in New York, it's the same. <laughs> On behalf of the Concordia Ukrainian Students' Union, I'd like to thank Dr. Valentin Moroz for... I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Valentin Moroz for a very thought-provoking evening. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, the uh, fellow students, the Concordia Ukrainian Students Union, who, were, who helped out in uh, helping uh, realize this evening, as well as uh, our audience this evening, all of you who took the time out to uh, come and see Professor Moroz uh, speak this evening. I'd like to uh, now uh, invite the uh, audience to remain for some coffee if they wish. We have some coffee behind these blackboards. We'll be pulling the blackboards uh, away in a moment. Unfortunately, we were supposed to have the reception downstairs at a more perhaps appropriate uh, location. Unfortunately, due to scheduling problems, difficulties, we were unable to uh, find another uh, place. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my last word today, excuse me my English. Thank you.